It is now time for oral questions. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question uh, to the Premier. Uh, Premier, on Thursday's budget, you put your foot on the accelerator of government spending and deeper debt when you should have hit the brakes and headed in the other direction altogether. Let me put this into perspective. If that Liberal budget were to pass, that means a little girl born in the province of Ontario tomorrow will have $20,000 of provincial debt on her back. The moment she comes into this beautiful world, Speaker, $20,000 in provincial debt on her back because we couldn't make the decisions to live within our means today. By the way, Speaker, that's doubled, Premier, under the Liberal government. Premier, don't you think it is morally wrong to slap $20,000 on the back of a newborn child in this province simply to keep the Liberal Party in power? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That little girl born today, when she turns four or maybe even three, if she's born late in the year, Mr. Speaker, she'll be able to go to, June, to uh, here, here. junior kindergarten full day. Yeah. That little girl, if she's born today, her family will have access to the best medical care in the world, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Here, here. That little girl, if she's born today, she'll be able to grow up, Mr. Speaker, into an excellent post-secondary education system, Mr. Speaker, that I hope by the time she's there, we'll have a better connection with the, the workforce, Mr. Speaker, so she'll be able to find a job in this beautiful province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. I can change uh, uh, channels, too, so uh, let's just keep it down. Uh, supplementary, please, Leader. I, I think the, the problem here is that the, um, the Liberal government is failing basic economic math here, Speaker. $11 billion uh, is the uh, debt interest payments uh, each and every year. $11 billion that could go to build stronger universities and colleges. $11 billion that could go into building subways and highways and opening up new jobs in our province. Instead, you're spending $11 billion to send to largely overseas lenders, Premier. Don't you think that that shows the government has become morally bankrupt when $11 billion that could go to health, could go to education, could go to transportation is actually overseas to our lenders instead of helping that child to go into a province where she has good job opportunities and a healthy future? You Question. can build the future prosperity, Premier, on a foundation of debt. Doesn't the Liberal government understand that basic premise? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18, Mr. Speaker. I am very confident in the ability of the businesses in this province, Mr. Speaker, to work with us to create jobs. What this budget is about is about creating the conditions to create jobs in the province, Mr. Speaker, to work on the issues that affect people's everyday lives, and to invest in the future, Mr. Speaker, so that that child who is born today has all of the advantages that he or she deserves, Mr. Speaker. That's what this budget is about. And, Mr. Speaker, I also want to say to the to the party opposite that there are there are initiatives in this budget, like the acceleration of the capital cost allowance, that will create opportunities for business in this province. I would have expected that the party opposite would have been supporting that, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, Speaker, I think the. Um the Premier understands that the capital cost uh, allowance acceleration is a federal initiative under Prime Minister Harper that you're simply emulating here. Um, Speaker, back to the um, back to the uh, the Premier. You know, it's telling, uh, Speaker, that within days of the most recent uh, Liberal budget that increased spending and brought our our debt hole even deeper. We saw Minister of Training Colleges and Universities come to order. The Waterloo. A uh, loss of furniture company, 200 and some jobs now going to Michigan. Caterpillar has now closed down their second plant in the province of Ontario. Um, I know, Premier, that you've dismissed. Remember, from loss Cambridge, of your leader is asking a question. But certainly, in light of the latest two closures and the men and women who are now out of work in our province, doesn't this tell question? you that your budget and your plan is actually on the wrong track, and we should go down a different direction altogether? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, I know it is, it's always painful for families, for workers when, uh, when uh, businesses leave, Mr. Speaker, when jobs are lost. But, Mr. Speaker, the reality is we've regained more than 400,000 jobs since the economic downturn, Mr. Speaker. And it seems
seems to me that it is even more imperative that we have a plan in place, Mr. Speaker. And the member opposite talks about the capital cost allowance. If this budget doesn't pass, Mr. Speaker, our part of that equation will not be in place. And it's it's very important for businesses. It's the number one ask, Mr. Speaker, of businesses in the province, particularly manufacturing. So I would suggest, Mr. Speaker, that if the leader of the opposition is interested in economic growth and stability and job creation, he would read our budget and he would support it, Mr. Speaker. Of the opposition. Back to the uh, Premier, Speaker. Um, Premier, I think we'll respectfully disagree. Uh, when I talk to business owners, managers, and workers, the number one advice I get from them is it's time to change the government in this province and try to go down a very different path in Ontario. Back to um, my uh, illustration, uh, Premier, on the fact that uh, your Liberal uh, spending budget will put $20,000 on the back of a newborn child in the province. By the way, that has doubled under the Liberal time in office, or nearly doubled, to be perfectly accurate about it. But, Premier, I think you understand also that people don't lend us that money for free. They don't simply hand it over. We need to pay it back plus interest. And that means that our overseas lenders are using that money, the billions of dollars, to invest in their own subways, invest in their own highways, to invest in their own post-secondary education. So when that little girl grows up, she's going to have a tougher time getting a job because those jobs will go somewhere else. Don't you understand? What's at risk, Kimber? When you think about the impact the Question. moral bankrupt approach to that much debt today and then taking away future job opportunities, don't you think it's time to take a very different approach in our province to focus on jobs Thank and you. make government spend within its means? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, I, I really believe that it's not an either-or proposition. So, you know, for the fourth year in a row, Mr. Speaker, we've beaten our fiscal targets. We have, uh, we're the only government in Canada to have done so, Mr. Speaker. And so, we are on track to do that again for a fifth year, and we're on track to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. That's very important to us. Member and from Northumberland, come to order, please. Speaker. But if the leader of the opposition had his way, he would park all of the service enhancement. He would park the investment investments in the future for that young child who is the, the baby who's the, either born today or the young child who is starting school today. And I don't believe we can do that. I believe that simultaneously, Mr. Speaker, we have to continue to be fiscally responsible. We have to stay on track to eliminate the deficit. And we have to make sure that our the services, our Lee, education, our health care, our investments Answer. in infrastructure, that we continue those because those are what guarantee that the future will be bright for that baby that's born today, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the, um, the Premier says it's not an either-or proposition. I obviously disagree. It's either further decline or moving our province forward again. It's either staying deep in debt or actually building the future prosperity for the great province of Ontario. It's either embracing, as the Liberals seem to do, that we're a have-not province with hands out for payments, or actually saying that our great province of Ontario can actually lead again, the best in jobs, the best for business, and in so doing, the support we can have for important public services. So, Premier, the choice is very clear. You say on page 109 of your budget that you're actually going to dig a deeper deficit. I'm incredulous at a time they were so deep in debt, they're actually going to increase the size of the deficit, put us deeper into debt. You are condemning that child born in the world tomorrow to a less prosperous province of Ontario than we want to see. We want to see Question. that Ontario recaptured again that leads this great country, Canada. Premier, why don't you? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I have huge confidence in this province, and the reason I do, Mr. Speaker, is because of our well-educated workforce, because of the excellent health care and education systems that we, that we support, Mr. Speaker, and because of our commitment to investing in infrastructure, creating jobs, Mr. Speaker. What the Leader of the Opposition does not outline is what the impact of the cuts that he would make, yep, Mr. Speaker, the what the impact of those cuts would be. That would mean, Mr. Speaker, that we would be taking teachers out of the classroom, Mr. Speaker. We would be reducing the support to people who are 
in need of health care, Mr. Speaker. We would not be able to continue to invest in home care, Mr. Speaker, and we would not be able to build the roads and bridges and make sure that the infrastructure in northern and rural Ontario is repaired and built as it needs to be, Mr. Speaker. Answer. That is what, at, what is at risk if the Leader of the Opposition had his way, Mr. Speaker. We're not going down that road, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Final supplementary. You know, clearly, uh, Speaker, this, this budget was nothing more than a blatant attempt to buy the support of the NDP. Uh, you chose to uh, spend about a billion dollars to close gas plants in Mississauga and Oakville to uh, save political uh, hides uh, Liberal members in those areas. And now you're going to use another, ironically, billion dollars to try to buy support from the NDP. I ask you again to think of that, that newborn child in our province tomorrow, whether she's born at Sunnybrook or in Niagara. I don't think we owe it to that child speaker to make sure that we don't become the Greece of Canada. We don't want to become the California of this great country, Canada. We want to see an Ontario that's strong, prosperous, and proud. Premier, I think you, I think you know this that any government that spends beyond its means year after year after year is going to decline. We want to surge ahead to a more prosperous, stronger province of Ontario, spend with our means and bring jobs back to our great province. Premier, won't you do the same? Thank you, Mr. Premier. Mr. Speaker, in our, uh, in our budget, we're proposing a job use uh, a youth job strategy, Mr. Speaker. What we believe is that it is really important that we put in place the supports for young people. We know that the youth unemployment rate, Mr. Speaker, is unacceptably high—16.5 percent. It's unacceptable. We need to do something about that, Mr. Speaker. That's the plan that we put in our budget, Mr. Speaker. There are seniors who are waiting for home care. We have put in our plan money to address that need, Mr. Speaker. Those are issues that affect people every single day. Mr. Speaker, they're not NDP issues, they're not conservative issues, they're not liberal issues. They are the issues that are confronting the people of this province. That's what this budget speaks to, Mr. Speaker. And I really believe that that baby born today needs to be Answer. part of a family and part of a society that has opportunity. That's what this budget is about, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. As the Premier knows, her government signed an agreement with Ottawa to create a new tax loophole starting in 2015, which will allow Ontarians, Ontario's largest corporations to write off their HST on entertainment and other expenses. Now, According to budget estimates at the time, this is going to cost Ontario about $1.3 billion a year. Last week, in advance of the budget, Ontario's Minister of Finance wrote to his federal counterpart in the hopes of delaying this plan until the budget is balanced. My question to the Premier, is the Premier aware of any response yet? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm not aware of a response. We don't. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, as the leader of the third party said, uh, the Minister of Finance has written to her federal counterpart, um, and you know we will continue to work with the federal government, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that they collect 75% of Ontario taxes, and so we have to work with them. But, Mr. Speaker, I think it's very important to reiterate what the Minister of Finance has said many times. This is not a loophole. It's not a tax break. It's not a tax give. Away, and it's not new, Mr. Speaker. This is something that has been on the books and, and has been known about. It wouldn't say $1.3 billion, Mr. Speaker, as the uh, leader of the third party suggests. But, Mr. Speaker, I think what we're dealing with today is the reality that there is a budget that has been read in this House. There is a budget that now is on the table, Mr. Speaker, and I believe Answer. that it is time for all of the parties in this House to look at that right budget and in, make yeah. a decision on whether they're going to support right the budget or not, Mr. Speaker. Well, Speaker, on Thursday, while many of us were in budget lockup, Jim Flaherty, the Federal Minister of Finance, was asked about the letter in the House of Commons. He said, and I quote, there is a long-standing agreement between the Government of Ontario and the Government of Canada on this issue, and we are not going to abrogate that agreement. Oh. End quote. Does this come as a surprise to the Premier, Speaker? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I said, as I said, we have been in contact with the uh, with the federal government, and we will have we will have that conversation. But, Mr. Speaker, I really believe that we should 
talk about what is in the budget, Mr. Speaker, so that we can we can get some kind of read on whether the third party is interested in having that having that discussion and leading coming to a decision about what they're going to do. This budget is about creating jobs, Mr. Speaker. It's about helping people in their everyday lives. It's about every person and every region of the province having the supports that they need while we stay on track to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. This budget reflects the needs of the people in the province. We have connected with over 600,000 people Answer. at jobs roundtables, in face-to-face uh, -face town halls and in teletown halls, Mr. Speaker. I really hope that the leader of the third party is going to work with us and get this budget passed. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, in the budget lockup, officials from the Ministry of Finance indicated that the request would not come as any surprise to the federal government. They knew that they'd be asked particularly about this corporate tax loophole. So I asked the Premier what the federal government said when they were told that this letter would be coming. Sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I don't know what they said, but I think it's a good thing that they knew that the ask was coming because they know it's, it's of concern to us, and we will be working with them, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is that there is another conversation that we need to be having, and that is about what is at risk if this budget does not pass, Mr. Speaker. We need, we need to understand that if this budget doesn't pass, then the, the enhancement to the Ontario Child Benefit will not go ahead, Mr. Speaker, that the investment in a job strategy for youth will not go forward, Mr. Speaker, that the investment in enhanced home care and making sure that home care gets to people when they need it, that will not go forward, Mr. Speaker, that the investment in infrastructure in northern and rural Ontario, Mr. Speaker, the Roads and Bridges Fund, that will not go forward. All of that is at stake. The people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, I do not believe want an election at this point. I believe that they Order. want to see these initiatives go Answer. forward. That can only happen if the support of this House will allow us to get this budget passed, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. New question? The third party. To the Premier Speaker, you know, unfortunately, this is exactly the sort of move that's making people very cynical about government, particularly this government. The government says it would be unfair to open this new corporate tax loophole while we're trying to balance the books. That's what the letter said. But instead of working hard to get that job done, the minister wrote a hasty last-minute letter the day before the budget was released. There was no mention of closing that $1.3 billion loophole anywhere in the budget speech or the budget document. Does the Premier understand that people want to see real results in this budget, not just empty promises that leave the same old status quo in place in this province? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, so this is not a loophole. It's not a tax break. It's not new, Mr. Speaker, and we're working with the federal government to address it. But, Mr. Speaker, there is a large uh, range of initiatives in this budget, Mr. Speaker, that speak to the needs of the people in the province, speak to the issues that I have heard, that my colleagues across government have heard about the need for jobs, particularly youth, Mr. Speaker, yeah. the, uh, the need for opportunities for youth to find uh, internships, placements. That's what our youth strategy is about. The need for young people who want to start new jobs to have access to some capital, Mr. Speaker, yeah. and to have access to some advice around entrepreneurship and, and business plans. Those kinds of supports, Mr. Speaker, are part of our youth employment strategy, and I hope that the yes, leader sir. of the third party will be able to support that, Mr. Speaker. I believe that this is a time for decisiveness. There has been a lot of conversation, and we all know I believe in conversation, but now's the time to decide, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I've been hearing from a lot of Ontarians since this budget was tabled last week. Many people saw that that budget reflected new Democrat proposals to take a balanced approach to balancing the budget and to make life more fair for people. But they also see a government that constantly makes promises that they don't intend on keeping. Does the Premier understand why this kind of behaviour makes people cynical about politics? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I've been part of a government that said we were going to bring in full-day kindergarten. We're doing that, Mr. Speaker. I'm part of a government that said that we were going to invest in transit in the GTHA and beyond. We've done that, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek will withdraw. I'm sorry. Uh, now that I remembered what I'm supposed to do, would you please return to your seat to withdraw?
Supplementary. Speaker, people want to trust their government. We put forward some ideas to ensure that the budget would deliver for people and be accountable to them. But whether it's a failure to include a guarantee for home care wait times or any timelines at all to ensure that auto insurance premiums will actually come down in this province, whether it's hundreds of millions of dollars waste on, wasted on cancelled private power deals on top of which we've seen millions, hundreds of millions diverted to well-connected insiders, or the lack of any serious effort whatsoever to close the $1.3 billion corporate tax loophole, people fear that they're going to be getting more of the same. Is the government ready to listen to some new ideas to make this budget more accountable and genuinely work for the people of this province? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry. There has been there has been ample opportunity for the people of the province and for the third party to give their input, Mr. Speaker. And to say at this point that we have not listened borders on the ludicrous, Mr. Speaker. If you look at our budget, you will see that we have addressed the issues that the NDP raised largely because they were issues that we were concerned about too, and that's a good thing, Mr. Speaker. I have said there's common ground, and there's common ground with the party opposite as well. But, Mr. Speaker, to suggest now that we start all over again, we start from scratch and build a new budget, it's just not going to happen, Mr. Speaker. We have presented a budget. It is a responsible budget. It is an even-handed budget, and it is a budget that is in the best interest of the people of this province. I hope that the third party will support us and we can get that budget passed. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. The member from community, uh, community services, please, uh, Minister, come to order. New question. The member from Whitby, Oshawa. Premier, we've heard the story about the power plant documents. Can you assure us that there are no other cabinet documents that you've signed without reading or that you don't understand? <laughs> Government House Leader. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, it's, uh, it's always uh, it's always amusing to hear the Progressive Conservative Party ask about power plant documents. Mr. Speaker, in an effort to be as transparent as possible, the uh, Premier asked government members to put forward a motion, Mr. Speaker, which would have produced all documents related to the power plant over a very long time period from a variety of ministries and agencies, the Premier's the office, the Cabinet office, covering exactly what she spoke. And, Mr. Speaker, to the astonishment of everyone on this side, of the House, the members of the Progressive Conservative Party and New Democratic Party voted against it. But you know, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to transparency, I guess the big question we have for them are when are yes, Progressive Conservative candidates uh, going to appear question. in front of the committee? Thank we have you. sent out numerous invitations and yet they re refuse to come forward. Supplementary. This to the Premier because it's really a pretty simple question. You said last week that you'd signed a cabinet document without reading it. So I'll ask you again what other cabinet documents are out there that you've signed without reading? Mr. Speaker, again, the Premier, the Premier, 
The Premier was in front of the committee for, I believe it was 90 minutes, and answered uh, a great number of questions related to documents related to the situation. But you know what's very interesting, Mr. Speaker, is you know who we haven't heard from is the Leader of the Opposition. And let me go through the chronology, Mr. Speaker. After they stood up and they refused to apologize and threw out terms like construction snitch and would make sure the Premier doesn't play calendar, their Leader of the Opposition, talk about a double standard, was asked to come on April 30th. All of a sudden, he was too busy. He wrote a letter, said maybe May 7th or the 14th. So we asked him for May 7th. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? He's too busy. Maybe May 14th. Who knows when, Mr. Speaker, are we going to see the Leader of the Opposition, who appeared in his own YouTube video to talk about the cancellation of the plans Thank to come before the committee? When Thank are we going to see that? Thank you. New question. The order. When? Order. When he can. How come the, uh, the group? Uh, the, the government house leader and the member from Simcoe Gray come to order. New question, please. The member from Nickelbelt. Thank you. I have a question for the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. It will be available when it is needed. They are looking for a guarantee that no one, no matter where they live in Ontario, will be forced to wait longer than five days. And they want the system to be funded responsibly, not at the expense of other health care services. Can the minister explain why her government is refusing to take these logical steps? Thank you, Speaker. And, and quite the contrary, this budget is great for people who are advocating for more care for people in their own homes. In fact, Speaker, we've had to make some difficult decisions along the way to get to the point where we can, in fact, invest more in the community sector. Speaker, we estimate that 46,000 more people will have access to home care thanks to this budget this year alone. So we, Speaker, have been shifting. We are providing more care at home. It's, the what people, it's where people want to be cared for. If they're ready to go for a hospital, we need to be there in their own home. This is a really great budget for people who have been advocating for more home care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, New Democrats' plan for home care would eliminate the wait list for care, guarantee services for everyone within five days, and fund these changes through savings like a hard cap on CEO salaries. But the plan presented by this government not only leaves Ontarians without guarantee, but it cuts hospital services in order to fund home care. Can the minister explain why her government refuses to introduce the cost-saving proposal and instead cuts hospital care to fund home care? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, speaker, what's important to me is that patients are getting the care that they need. And if we can care for patients at home instead of in hospital, they're getting the, it, higher quality care at home, Speaker, it's where they want to be, then we have to be prepared to make the tough decisions to, to serve more people where they want to be cared for at home. So that's what we're doing, Speaker, and it hasn't been easy. You'll remember that. Uh, uh, that there, we've had some uh, difficult challenges to get to the point where we're able to make this investment. When we took on the, uh, uh, the price of generic drug speaker, I'm not sure I remember the opposition Order. standing with us. Well, we had to have that difficult conversation with Ontario's doctors to, uh, to hold that envelope steady. I don't remember opposition standing with us supporting that decision. It's because of changes like that, Speaker, that we have been able to really invest Answer. where patients need that investment, and that is in the home care sector Absolutely. and community care sector. Thank you. New question. The member from York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is also for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The single most important thing to seniors in my riding of York Southwestern, and I believe all across Ontario, is their health and well-being. They want to know that they can access hospital care when they need it, drug prescriptions when they need it, and home care when they need it. It is our responsibility to provide that balance. Mr. Speaker, most seniors wish to remain in their homes as long as possible, but sometimes need some extra help. 
help in order to do so. Speaker, can the minister please tell us what we are doing as a government to ensure that people who need care at home and in their community are able to access it? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, I thank the member from uh, York Southwestern for being a tireless advocate for providing better care for people in their own home. Speaker, we know that if we can deliver care at home, that's better for patients and it's better for our health care system. So whether ne people need help getting to the appointments, the if they need uh, resources for community mental health and addictions care, <laughs> whether they need PSWs or nurses to come to their, uh, to their home, Speaker, our commitment is very strong. Health care starts at home. So our, our commitment in this budget will strengthen community, uh, will be uh, increasing funding by $260 million beginning this year. That's growing to $700 million, Speaker, if this budget passes. This is a very important initiative Answer. in our health care system. I really do hope that members from all sides will understand how important this is to seniors Thank you. in this province. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Minister. Care at home and in our community do make a difference, sometimes a very big difference, in the lives of our seniors. And my constituents are concerned about wait times for home care services. It's important that they get the services when they need them. Could the minister please tell us a little more about how long seniors have to wait and how will the government be able to increase support to community health care? Uh, thank you, Speaker. And um, the, the members who are heckling across the way might recall that the ask was for $30 million. We're putting in $185 million, Speaker. So we are six times the commitment when it comes to dollars. And these new investments will to set the target of a five-day wait speaker for people with uh, complex conditions who need home care from a nurse or a personal support worker. Speaker, we are demonstrating that we are standing with patients. We are standing with people who are asking for, uh, for care to be delivered in their home. We, we have a five-day target for people no matter where in the province they live, Speaker. Together, we can get this done. It's the right thing for the people of this province. We all benefit when people get the care they need in the right place. Answer. Thank you. New question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. <coughs> Premier, last week at the Justice Committee, we learned the gas plant scandal leads all the way to your office. You outlined eight cabinet interactions you had regarding the Oakville and Mississauga gas plant cancellations. You admitted you personally signed off on Second one of time. the side deals that led to the $275 million Mississauga cost, and you personally signed off on the arbitration agreement for Oakville in July of 2011. You knew, Premier. Yet despite our questioning, you refused to tell us when you knew the tab for Oakville was more than $40 million. Premier, is the reason for that because that would prove that you and your entire cabinet would be held in contempt? Very good. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Premier had, uh, I believe, as I say, 90 minutes in front of the committee, and I think the most important thing to talk about when it comes to Oakville is the fact that she personally asked the Auditor General to, to uh, look into it. But, Mr. Speaker, you know, let's go back to the arrogance of the Conservatives. The member from Leeds Grenville stood and said to the Premier, listen to this, next Tuesday you've been invited to appear before the Justice Committee. Will you confirm to the House today that you will order and instruct your staff to not play calendar or scheduling calendar? games? Now, Mr. Speaker, who's, who's playing, playing calendar? calendar? Who's playing schedule games? April 30th, we requested the Leader of the Opposition to appear in front of the committee to talk about his costing, his estimates. He refused, Mr. Speaker. May 7th, we asked him to appear in front of the committee. He had even written a letter saying that he was available. Answer. He's refused, Mr. Speaker. When are we going to a, get an apology for the way, the way in which they address the Premier, and B, see the Leader of the Opposition in front of that committee. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Still no answer from the Premier right. on when. No answer equals contempt coming up, Speaker. I know that's a fact. 
Premier, Ontarians are fed up with the obstruction and obfuscation we've seen from you putting Liberal interests ahead of the people. We've had Liberal witness after witness appear before the committee and continue to sidestep the truth. We've heard from a Liberal staffer that he illegally deleted emails. Today, we've learned from an FOI request that the emails of the former Chief of Staff, Principal Secretary and Deputy Director of Policy conveniently no longer exist and cannot be recovered from the tape. Thank you. Premier, how can you condone this contemptuous behaviour of your government? Will you bring the confidence motion to the floor of this House for a vote? I ran through my Rolodex in my thesaurus head here, and I did know that the member said something that was unparliamentary. Could you withdraw, please? Thank you. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I have a handy timeline here. April 16th, we requested four opposition candidates to testify, including PC candidate Jeff Janicek of the Robocall fame and Zurn Church in the Mississauga East Cookville PC candidate. Mr. Speaker, they all declined. No. April 30th, Tim Hudak is asked to, excuse me, the Leader of the Opposition is asked to testify. He declines. No. Backup witnesses Janicek and Churchin also declined. We then invited PC candidate Marianne DeMonte Whalen. She accepts, but a few hours before her testimony, she declines. Oh, no May 2nd, Janicek, Churchin and DeMonte Whalen are called to testify. Janicek tells the clerk of the committee to, quote, stop calling him and the other two do not respond. And then May 7th, Mr. Speaker, once again, once again, Mr. Speaker. The member from Renfrew, uh, Nipissing Pembroke, will come to order. Thank you. Just wrap up. May 7th, Mr. Speaker, we asked the Leader of the Opposition to appear before the committee, Thank something you. he's indicated in writing, and yet again, he. Thank you. New question? The member from Bramley Gormalton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, in 2010, this government slashed accident benefits to the tune of 70% in major areas in the GTA. The slashing of our benefits resulted in, I repeat, a 70% reduction in payouts in major areas in the GTA. Yet in three years, despite this reduction in payouts, in three years, hard-pressed drivers have yet to see a penny, a penny of those savings trickle down to them in the form of lower premiums. I ask this government, how long do they think people should wait for their premiums to actually go down? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Finance. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I guess the easy answer to that is support the budget. Yeah. Yeah. Because the moment you do that, that's a, as soon as possible that we can start getting fiscal to get some teeth to provide the oversight necessary to ensure that the costs that are saved in those claims can be translated into premium reductions. We're on the same page on that. We want to see that happen as soon as possible. We know we've been able to translate a portion of that already. We need to do more. We need your support to make it happen. Make it happen. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the problem is the budget bill does not include any timeline whatsoever for these reductions. So the 15% reduction in premiums could take two years, could take three years, could take five years. Nobody knows how long they will take. After three years of waiting, after seeing the benefits that consumers receive slashed, how long does this government think people should wait to see the reductions come through in the form of lower premiums? I ask again, Mr. Speaker, how long does this government expect consumers to wait to see a 15 per cent reduction in auto, in auto insurance premiums? Thank you, Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, I mean, the member opposite recognized the complexity of the situation. It's why he put in his private member's bill that it should be a gradual reduction, knowing that we need to take this in a very concerted effort. We have to get at the root causes. We're taking steps necessary a couple of years ago to go against the anti-fraud initiatives. We're working now with the industry to ensure that we pass on those savings to the 
to the drivers, to the premium holders, to the consumers. This is for the benefit of 9 million drivers across Ontario. We recognize the importance of doing this. We recognize the importance of doing this quickly. It's one of the reasons that in this bill we're asking fiscal to reduce the ROE by 25 percent. That's why we're asking the uh, fiscal to provide the oversight necessary to work with the industry to pass on the loans along those savings and forcing them to do so. It is why Answer. the industry is prepared to work with us because together we're going to reduce the cost of claims well, well beyond on that which is existing in other Thank parts you. of the Canada, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Scarborough Rouge River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is, if, is to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Every day I speak with young people living in my riding of Scarborough Rouge River. They tell me about the number of challenges they face to enter in the workforce and embarking on a career. These young people want to find meaningful employment that will take advantage of their skills, talents, and knowledge. We all know that the unemployment rate among young people is disproportionately high, and I'm concerned about the impact this could have on the long-term strength and sustainability of our workforce here in, in Toronto and in Ontario. From our province to be, for our province to be competitive and for our economy to grow, we need to ensure that young people have opportunities to access good, meaningful jobs. Mr. Speaker, can the minister Question. please explain the steps this government is taking to help our young people find good jobs and contribute to our economy and our communities? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, both training. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Scarborough Rouge River for his advocacy on behalf of young people, not just in his riding, but right across this province. And I'm pleased to say in Ontario's 2013 budget, this government is making an unprecedented investment in our young people. Mr. Speaker, we're investing in programs that will help them find jobs and put their considerable skills and talents to work to help grow Ontario's economy, not just now, but for decades to come. And Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the NDP for working with us, in fact, for bringing this issue to the fore early on, and, and I have no doubt that we'll be working uh, as we uh, find the exact way to uh, make this program work, that we'll continue to work together on this important issue. With an investment in our budget of $295 million Oh, Our government will work with businesses to create 30,000 new jobs for Answer. young people in this province. I look forward to the member's supplementary so I can provide more uh, details about this important yeah. initiative. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it is good to know that this government is committed to giving young people the boost they need to succeed. The initiatives that the minister mentioned to create opportunities are especially good for young people in Scarborough Rouge River and across the province who are keen about finding meaningful employment. Speaker, Order, we know the economy is changing, and today, more than ever before, young people need skills in entrepreneurship to allow them to start their own businesses. In my riding, I hear great and innovative ideas from youth who are ready to put their ideas in action and become job creators themselves. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain what this government is doing to expand opportunities to young people so they can succeed as entrepreneurs and contribute to the growth Answer. of Ontario's economy. Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Thank Employment. You, Mr. Speaker, our member is absolutely right. Our young people have the skills and creativity to become job creators themselves and to help to grow our economy and ensure that we stay competitive through the 21st century. And as announced in the budget, as part of our youth job strategy, we propose to create a $195 million youth employment fund, which is a fund that's going to expand job opportunities for youth. But we're going further, Mr. Speaker. We propose to also create a youth entrepreneurship fund valued at $45 million over two years that will support young entrepreneurs through mentorship, startup capital and outreach. And we're going even further, Mr. Speaker. We're proposing to create a $30 million youth innovation fund to help put new innovation research into action, turning ideas into job creation. And finally, Mr. Answer. Speaker, a business labour connectivity and training fund to help make connections and bridge those skills gaps so all our young people can have access Thank you. to prosperity. Thank you. New question, a member from the Pete and Carlton. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is uh, to the Premier. Uh, you only needed to go to a picnic, a walkathon, or bake sale, or a ribbon cutting this weekend to know that your government is in big trouble. No one believes your government didn't know 
everything about the gas plant cancellations and no one Order. believes your government has any principles left after delivering a made by the NDP budget. You signed the memorandum to Cabinet on the cancelled Oakfield gas plants, which either means you have not been telling the whole story or your competency is in question. Now that you have demonstrated your disregard for the public, proven you're not up to the job, and that you lost the confidence of the people of this province, will you put our PC confidence motion to a vote? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I would suggest, Mr. Speaker, that this question is actually even less relevant today than it was last week, Mr. Speaker, because now the budget is before us. Yeah. And, Mr. Speaker, that budget is a confidence motion exactly. by definition, Mr. Speaker. So I really, I really believe that the member opposite will have an opportunity to weigh in on her opinions around youth unemployment, around more home care for the seniors and the people with disabilities in her riding on infrastructure investment, Speaker. She will have an opportunity to weigh in on all of those initiatives when she votes for the budget motion. I look forward for her support, Mr. Speaker. Big news flash. I won't be supporting that budget. haven't in my career, and I'll never support that government after the devastation that they have put across the manufacturing sector in this, kind, in this province. But uh, I just want to say to this Premier, every game that she plays, every story that she stretches, every concession that she gives to the Democrats to stay in power delegitimizes her in the eyes of everyday Ontarians. No one trusts you anymore. You said the can cancelled Oakville plan only cost $40 million. That was off by 775 percent. You said you didn't know the true cost, but David Lindsay, David Livingston, uh, Carol, Shelley Jamison, Joanne Butler, and Colin Anderson all say that's not true. When will you either call our conference motion to the floor of this assembly or go directly to the polls because the people of this province want to have you. their say on you? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier, go. Speaker, should get a question. Mr. Speaker, I think we have all been impressed with the openness of the Premier. When it comes to the Oakville plant, Mr. Speaker, the Premier personally asked the Auditor General to come forward with a figure. The simple fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, we learned at committee last week there are now, I believe, four estimates for the Oakville plant that we need the level of certainty that the Auditor General can bring forward. We've heard, Mr. Speaker, of the uh, uh, move by the Premier to have members of the committee, Liberal members, move a motion to make all documents available. She herself appeared when requested in front of the committee. In fact, the former Premier, Who's the member from appearing? Ottawa South, will be appearing tomorrow. But the real question, Mr. Speaker, is where is the openness on the progressive conservative side, Mr. Speaker? Where is the leader of the opposition when he's requested over and over and over again to appear. Where are the PC candidates who are refusing to appear? Because we want to hear about their Thank analysis you. and their costing Thank as they you. headed into the last election. The question the member from Beaches, East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Even the bookies in Toronto can't peg the odds on whether Toronto will hit the jackpot for hosting a casino. The Premier stood in this House and said, and I quote her, there is no special deal for any municipality in the province. But media reports on the weekend suggest that the OLG is anting up $100 million for a downtown site. My question, is somebody bluffing or is this Liberal government laying a huge side bet on a Toronto casino? Finance. Thank you for the question and I'll uh, reiterate again that there is no special deal for Toronto. Right. Everyone in the province, every municipality, every region, everywhere that we're dealing with regards to OLG, OLG transformation, to try to bring in another million, billion dollars more to build hospitals and to build schools and to help with our, our infrastructure, those transformational changes will continue, but not, not at the expense of any municipality. There is no special deal. We haven't landed on a formula as yet, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As Kenny Rogers once sang, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. The OLG doesn't seem to be folding, they're not walking away and they're not running. 
So it looks like they're at the table and getting set to raise the stakes for a Toronto casino to $100 million. Is the Premier, is the Finance Minister ready to go all in now, even though the Premier said there would be no special deal for Toronto? Minister of Finance. <laughs> oh, the member opposite can play all he wants, but we're not playing a game here. This is serious business. Exactly. We recognize the importance this has for the province of Ontario. We recognize the importance this has for the people of Ontario. And it's incumbent upon us to ensure that whatever we do is consistent and fair, and transparent, and the same right across the province. That's what we're going to be doing. And what you're reading and what you're saying is speculation. I wouldn't bet on that. <laughs> Thank you. And the member from Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Thank you, Speaker. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la ministre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Investments in emergency management, and we are committed to a safe Ontario for everyone. Today marks the kickoff of Emergency Preparedness Week. Okay. This particular week gives us the opportunity to take the time and ensure that we are able to deal with an emergency if and when one happens. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us what the government is doing to increase Ontarians' awareness and ability to face emergencies? Thank you, Minister of Community Mr. Services Mr. and Correctional Services. Services. Thank you to the member, the good member of Glengarry Prescott okay. Russell and my parliamentary assistant. Yes. Mr. Speaker, last year we successfully responded to 24 declared emergencies. Yeah. Through emergency management Ontario, we coordinate between provincial and federal ministries to provide the most efficient assistance to municipalities and First Nation communities that need our help. Municipalities also play an, a very important role. They set their emergency plan, and I encourage everyone to know about their community safety procedures. Finally, I always say that emergency preparedness is not just the responsibility of your government. It's everyone's responsibility, so make sure that you have a plan, make sure that you, you know about the plan of your municipality, Answer. and especially have a survival kit ready. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Merci, Madame la Ministre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your answer. Is actively promoting emergency preparedness by working collaboratively with municipal and federal governments. Speaker, I've heard that there will be a focus on seniors this year for Emergency Preparedness Week, and it's very important that seniors are aware of potential dangers and know what they can do to be prepared in the event of an emergency. Mr. Speaker, seniors are sometimes the most vulnerable, and everyone needs to ensure their safety. Can the minister please tell us what we're doing to make sure that in the, in the case of an emergency situation that our seniors have the tools and the knowledge to be safe? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, last Friday I was in my riding at the St. Paul in Charon with the minister responsible for seniors, and I announced that this year we want to focus on seniors because they can be especially vulnerable during an emergency. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, EMO is co in collaboration with the Ontario Senior Secretariat has developed a new emergency preparedness guide for seniors. This guide shows how easy it is to be prepared for different emergencies and outlines the circumstances we need that seniors should consider when they plan for emergency. Mr. Speaker, I also want to encourage everyone to take part of this week and help build a safer community for all Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, it was very interesting because the head of the Francophone seniors in Ontario was there, and she told us that they have to be ready, but they also are grandparents, and often Answer. they babysit their grandson or daughter, and they need to be ready for them too. So it was a good message. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, I have a simple question for you based on the findings of the Justice Committee. With $600 million in waste, a resignation of a minister and a former Premier, the failure to produce documents on three separate occasions, and your refusal to say exactly how much the Oakville and Mississauga cancellation costs are, is there any reason why this legislature should not find your government in contempt. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it, it is a case where they can't take yes for an answer. The Oakville situation is one that is a concern 
to the Justice Committee, its concern to this government, and when the Premier assumed office, one of her, her first actions was to ask the Auditor General and officer of this House to look into it. Mr. Speaker, she made herself available for 90 minutes in front of the committee, and the former Premier, the member from Ottawa South, is going tomorrow. But I ask the member again, and perhaps he can address this in his supplementary. What are the Conservatives trying to hide? Why will the Leader of the Opposition not appear in front of the committee? Why will progressive Conservative candidates who sent out thousands of pamphlets talking about how they were in favour of the cancellation of the plan, who had robocalls, Mr. Speaker, who appeared in YouTube yes, videos with the Leader of the Opposition, who sent out tweets? Mr. Speaker, why will they not appear in front of the Thank committee you. and tell their side of the story? Supplementary. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, I think that the government house leader just said yes that his government is in contempt of this legislature. He did. He did. I can't believe it. But I'll ask the Premier once again. Your numbers are wrong. You botched document dumps, and you haven't been forthright about what you knew and when. The people of Ontario have lost confidence in your government. We on this side have lost confidence in your government. The only people who seem to have confidence in your government are you and your government and half of the NDP caucus. Which half? When the, will the Premier admit that her government botched this file and say, I am sorry to the people of Ontario? Regret isn't enough. Ontarians demand an apology. Premier, will you look into the camera? You can choose the one over my right shoulder, but I think you might like the one over my left. Question. And tell the people that you are sorry for what you've done to this province. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Government House Leader. Speaker. PhD, don't you know? Mr. Speaker, let's review. Not very Premier well. assumed office. She asked the Auditor General to look into Remember the Member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, come to order. She went to the opposition, Mr. Speaker, and offered a select committee. The opposition said no, they'd rather have a witch hunt against a former member of this legislature who's now in private life. Mr. Speaker, she offered to broaden the terms of reference of the committee, and it took them a week and a half to finally get back to us. Mr. Speaker, one of the first actions of the committee was Liberal members, at the advice of the Premier, to go forward and ask for a complete look through government agencies and ministries to deliver documents. And you know what happened, Mr. Speaker? The official opposition voted against it. Mr. Speaker, the Premier made herself available for 90 minutes to answer all questions, as did the member from Ottawa. Oh boy, I wish I knew who said that. And if the member is honourable, stand up and withdraw anyway. Go ahead. Mr. Speaker, all we are asking is the same level of cooperation from the Progressive Conservative Answer. Party that they will make their candidates available, they will make the Leader of the Opposition available to talk about their support for the cancellation of the gas plants in the last election. New question. The member from London, Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is the health, to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, residents in London are deeply concerned about the cuts they are seeing in our local hospitals. London Health Sciences is eliminating 60 positions, as is St. Joe's Healthcare. The one-of-a-kind rehabilitation pool at St. Joseph's is closing, and the hospital is warning of longer patient wait times for MRIs, PET scans, and CT scans. Can the minister explain why her government is cutting care? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Speaker, quite the contrary, and it's disappointing that the member from London Fanshawe she doesn't know isn't that. not is not paying attention to the transformation that is underway in healthcare in London and across the province. We are reducing ALC rates dramatically in London because we are providing more care at home. Speaker, if we can provide the member from Kitchener Waterloo and the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek come to order. Carry on. Speaker, what matters to me is that patients are getting the care they need, and if we can provide that care in their own home, where they want to be, then that is what I want to be doing, Speaker. That's where I want to be investing. If we can provide supportive housing, if we can provide day programs for people with Alzheimer's, Speaker, so they don't have to go into long-term care as, uh, uh, before they really need Answer. to, Speaker, those are the investments that we must make 
to transform our health care system. If you value universal health care, and I know we sure do Thank value you. universal health care, then you'd Thank support you support this trade. I think I should have offered the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek help an awful lot earlier. Supplementary. Speaker, New Democrats want to see improvements in our broader, broader health care, like in home care, but we do not want to see this being done at the expense of hospitals. We provided this government with a plan to improve home care by guaranteeing service within five days and fund these changes through savings like a hard cap on CEO salaries. But our advice was ignored. Can the minister explain why her government has refused to implement our cost savings proposals and is recklessly cutting hospital services? Uh, speaker, as I said earlier today, we have made some difficult choices when it, when it comes to the lower, reducing the price of uh, prescription drugs, Speaker, when it comes to holding the line on physician compensation. These have been difficult uh, uh, issues, Speaker, but we've done them for one reason and one reason only, so that we can expand access to home care, that we can support people in day programs, that we can provide respite care, Speaker. That is where the future of our health care system must go. Okay, I am going to offer some help, and that is to the member from Stony, Hamilton East Stony Creek. I'm going to warn him, and I'm going to also warn the member, the Minister of Community uh, Social Services. New question. The, the member from Oak Ridge is Markham. My question is for the Attorney General. I know that adjudicative tribunals play a vital role in Ontario's justice system. Tribunals help keep many disputes out of courts by using their specialized expertise to adjudicate on a wide variety of disputes in an independent and impartial manner. I also know that since 2010, this government has begun the process of clustering tribunals together in order to realize cost savings and efficiencies in this area. Mr. Speaker, could the Attorney General please tell us about about the clustering process and how the people of Ontario stand to benefit from it. Attorney General. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And first of all, I'd, li I'd like to thank the hardworking, dedicated member uh, for this question. She's extremely hard work on an annual basis. Speaker, there are over 600,000 hearings held annually before our administrative tribunals in the province of Ontario. And since 2010, we've been clustering them together under the Ministry of the Attorney General. And through that, we are building a more effective, efficient, and accessible system of justice by clustering all of these uh, administrative and adjudicative tribunals. By allowing the tribunals to share resources, expertise, and best practices while reducing duplication, clustering improves access to justice while getting better value for the taxpayers' dollars. We know that it works, too, Speaker. Feedback has been very positive from both the Environmental and Land Tribunals in Ontario and the Social Justice Tribunals, and they've been clustered since the last two or three years. In fact, the Drummond Commission Speaker recognized that this ministry has benefited in particular from the co-location of offices, right. common administrative functions, and procedural improvements. As a matter Thank of fact, Drummond said— uh, he's, I'm, I don't want to hear what he has to say. Sit down. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.